So hi, everyone. My name is Nalini Gulsran. I am the founder of Edge Space Marketing, a digital marketing company based out of Stanford, Connecticut. We provide digital marketing services to small business and nonprofits. We call it taking care of your entire digital ecosystem from social media to web development to your newsletter, whichever pieces you need, we make sure they work together. So today we're going to talk about how some of those pieces work for you in your marketing in terms of Google tools for optimizing your SEO. For those of you who were with me last week, hopefully we we have no tech difficulties this week, um, but also last week we talked about the basics of SEO. What are your ranking factors? What goes into it? And I'm going to touch on it briefly today, just in terms of what is search engine optimization at a really high level. And then we're going to go through talking about Google Analytics, your Google Search Console, how to submit your sitemap to Google, setting up your Google My Business, and then how to use Google Trends and Keyword Planner to identify those keywords. Now, keywords can be a little daunting. And next week, we're going to talk about in greater detail what it means to identify your keywords and how you can really build out a robust list for yourself. Uh, today's class will focus mostly on Google Analytics, Search Console, and Google My Business so that you get an opportunity to see how to set it up. I get that question often as you say set it up, but how do we do that? So we're going to walk through very carefully the steps that are involved in doing that. So let's talk about SEO at a just very high level. The question really is, are you on page one of Google? So how does SEO work? The goal is to increase the quality and the quantity of traffic to your website through organic search engine results. Quality and quantity are very important. Traffic to your website is good, but not all traffic is good. Meaning you can have a hundred users come to your website that are your potential clients that will do the business that you want, that they will become your clients, but you could also have a thousand people show up to your website. None of them are showing up for the right reasons. Maybe they're showing up for the wrong business. Maybe they're showing up for the wrong region. If you're hyper local, there's any number of reasons why traffic is not necessarily a good thing if it's not necessarily qualified. So let's talk about what that really means. When people wanna find information on the internet, they type or say, because now we have Siri and Amazon or Alexa, they say the words that they want that they're looking for. Google has a crawler that across the internet is crawling all these different websites and gathering information and storing them in their giant data warehouse. That information is indexed based on SEO criteria, ranking factors, and different reasons that they say, okay, this website is good for X, Y, and Z. But once you put in your search criteria, Google goes into that database, tries to find websites that match your search criteria, and then displays it. But there's a lot of factors that go into that. Now, if you want to check out last week's class, that's where we talked about all the different ranking factors. We're not going to get into those today specifically. But at a high level, the aspects of your SEO that you want to keep in mind are, are you identifying your keywords using Google Trends, or if you're an advanced user, Google Keyword Planner? And I'll explain the difference once we get there. You want to configure your on-site and off-site SEO. This is where the technicalities of your ranking factors come in. So check out the SEO basis class for that. Today, we're going to talk about configuring your Google Analytics and your Google Search Console, and then submitting your sitemap to your Google Search Console. That's very important. And then lastly, setting up your Google My Business. If you didn't, haven't done it, I'll walk you through the steps of setting that up. So let's talk about Google Analytics. Now I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time in this space, so don't worry that I went a little fast on those items. I wanna make sure we have enough time in this space. You get there by going to analytics.google.com. And the reason you wanna use your Google Analytics, a lot of people ask, why do I need this? What do the reports mean? Google Analytics really tracks your SEO, right? It's the process of collecting, tracking, and analyzing the data so that you could figure out how to grow your website traffic a little bit more. When you're looking at the report, there's a lot of different metrics. Here are some ones that I think are very important to help you as a beginner. If you're more of an advanced user, these are going to be rudimentary and you're going to be looking at other metrics, but here's where you want to start. You're looking at user traffic in terms of where they're coming from, where, how long they're spending on your website, which is on here, but you're also looking at the bounce rate. Very often, people misinterpret their bounce rate. And when we get to there, I will show exactly what I mean. But the bounce rate is essentially how often someone comes to your website and leaves without doing anything. They don't visit another website, or excuse me, a different another page on your website. They don't click any of the links. They don't maybe click one of the contact links, but that might also be by design. If you have a storefront and someone's coming to your website to check your hours, check your location, check your contact details, that's okay. 
And we'll talk some more about that in a bit. You're also checking to see the device they're coming from and some location data. This is a good indicator, particularly if you have a hyper-local business that you service only a specific service area. If you have traffic coming from other areas beyond your service area, it can help you either figure out should you expand, but more importantly, make sure that you're hitting your target audience. If you're a business based in Connecticut and a lot of your traffic is coming from California, perhaps something's misconfigured on your SEO side, right? Those are some things you want to think about. You also get to see what pages are the most popular and what people are most interested in that could inform other decisions you're making on the marketing front. And then lastly, how users are finding your website. Are they coming via Google? Are they coming directly, meaning they're typing the domain name or the URL right into the search bar? Or are they coming via social media? That's also important. These are all part of your ranking factors if you've been to that class, but you should know this as a business owner so you can understand how your uh, work is working for you, your marketing efforts. So when you go into your Google Analytics, this is the screen for where you're going to set up your analytics. You get here, after you go to analytics.google.com, in the lower left corner, there's a little gear icon. When you click that icon, this is the screen you will see. You have create account, create property, create view. From here, you're gonna click create property. And you're gonna to come to this screen about property details. And it sounds a little daunting, but first you're gonna type in the property name. So this is for you so you can identify it. If you have more than one business, this will be very important. If there's ever a chance you might have more than one business, you wanna fill this out, you can type in my website. I tend to name the website based on my business. And then you're going to pick your, um, your time zone. This is important so Google can aggregate your reports with the correct time zone so that you can figure out, for example, if your website is an e-commerce website and you need to take it down to do maintenance, this can help you figure out which window to do maintenance on it. Or if you need to make an announcement, it can also tell you when the right time is to make those type of announcements on your website. If for some reason that's all important to you, that report can help you know that. You then want to click on show advanced properties, or excuse me, show advanced options, which brings you to this screen. On this screen, you're going to want to click the button to turn on that creates a universal analytics property. Some of you may not uh, may have heard of this before, but Google has two types of properties. There's a universal analytics, which is what we'll call legacy, that's been around for a long time, and it's being sundown in 2023, so next year. So if you haven't transitioned yet, you have time, but they're now moving to what's called Google Analytics 4. It's their new reporting model, and they're encouraging all accounts to move in that direction. So once you've turned on the button, this is where you type in your domain name, www.whatever. You then click this button that says, create a Google Analytics 4 and a Google Analytics excuse me, universal analytics property. The reason this is important is because you need the new reporting, which is your Google Analytics 4. However, depending on how your website's set up, the websites themselves haven't quite caught up. So for example, Shopify still depend on the universal analytics property rather than the Google 4 or analytics 4. Um, WordPress, depending on how you have it set up, could use either or. So this just allows you to make sure you can connect your analytics to your website, regardless how your website's built. You then click next. The enable enhanced measurements will always come on by default. I usually leave it on. So you then click next. And then you get more questions. This is more of Google uh, gathering information. So what your industry category is, how big or small your business is, and how do you intend to use your Google Analytics? You don't necessarily have to fill in uh, the last one, but it's a good idea too. You never know if Google comes out with some stuff that could help you. Once you're done, it's gonna bring you to this screen. So this is where you're looking for in the upper right corner, your measurement ID, but also down at the bottom, there's some other things around Google site tags, Google tag manager, and your connected sites. I've highlighted all of these because depending on which website platform you have, which website platform setup you have, you may need any number of one of these to connect it to your website. If you're using Shopify, this UA number is your universal analytics property. If you're using um, uh, WordPress, Wix, or Squarespace, you may need one of these other numbers. So that's why it's a good idea to at least recognize them so that you could figure out which one you need based on your platform. And they usually have very good help docs to tell you this is what you need for your platform. 
So once you've done that, now you're starting to aggregate information and you get to your Google Analytics and you now see a report that looks like this and you go, now what? What does this mean? There's a bunch of numbers, there's some graphs, there's some figures, and I don't know exactly know what it means. So let's break down the numbers. The first thing you see are your users. This is the total number of unique users that have visited your website in this time frame. This is a 90 day time frame for my website so that you can see early from late last year to earlier this year, 404 unique users visited my website. And then there's a down arrow with 12.2 underneath. That's saying that it's down 12.2% for the previous 90 days. So in the fall of last year, I had more individual user traffic coming to my website. But what I also have here are sessions. What's the difference between a user and a session? One user can generate more than one session. So this is an indicator that of those 404 people, several of them came back more than one time. So in this case, it could be any permutation from one user came back five times, one user came back two times. We don't actually know that specific breakdown based on this report, but I do know that I got 100 more visits based on the number of users that came. That's a good indicator. You want returning traffic. Sometimes these numbers are equal, but more often returning traffic means they're more likely to do business with you because they've come back to your website. When you're looking at your bounce rate, your bounce rate can get very confusing. It's very often misinterpreted. This is one of those weird, rare instances where 100 is bad. In this case, if you have a 100% bounce rate and it's not by design based on how you built your website, that's not a good thing. So think of your bounce rate like a bouncing ball. That's where the term bounce comes from. A ball, when you drop it, hits the ground and leaves immediately, it bounced. And so Google is saying that users came to your website and they left almost immediately or they didn't do anything further. So they essentially bounced off your website. They may have gone to your competitor. They may have found what they're looking for. So in my case, my bounce rate is 68%. That is by design. I'm aiming for 50 to 80% at any given moment. And the reason for that is, is that I am not an e-commerce website. So I don't expect people to spend a lot of time on the website looking at different things. Very often people are coming to my website to verify that I'm a legitimate business based on classes that I teach. Maybe they're coming to look at the portfolio really quickly to see, okay, she can build websites. You know, there's a number of reasons. Other times they're coming to my website just to get my contact details. And I've designed my marketing strategy deliberately that way because as I get a lot of traffic from Google, it's not always qualified traffic. So I've changed my strategy a bit. So I'm not concerned with this number. If you are someone that's dependent heavily on traffic from Google and those phone calls and those inquiries, then you might want to take a look at your bounce rate and say, what's going on? There is a caveat here. If you have a single page website, what that means is that you have a website and your About Us services, Contact Us are all sections on the same page. They're not necessarily their own individual pages. In that case, as the user is scrolling and navigating your website, there's technically nowhere for them to go internally. There's no other pages for them to go to. So that can send a, um, a miss flag over to Google thinking that, okay, someone came and they bounced. How you offset that is by understanding your session duration. The average session time someone is spending on your website is usually around two to three minutes is a good thing. I have one minute, 34 seconds. I'm comfortable with that number. If I was seeing things, and I've seen this on other clients' website where you've got five, five seconds, you've got 30 seconds. I mean, some clients I've seen have seven minutes, which is amazing, but they're e-commerce websites where people are comparing items and figuring out if they want to buy. In this case, if they're coming to validate who I am and what services I want to offer, a minute, 34 seconds aren't too bad. But if you have a hundred percent bounce rate and you have only five seconds, or maybe like you have under a minute, you might want to consider a few things. Do you have a customer journey problem? Meaning, is it confusing for them to navigate? Is the messaging unclear? Are you speaking in too much jargon? Is the layout um, not modern? Meaning it's looking like it's 10 to 15 years old. It's not mobily responsive. These are all things that you have to figure out if your bounce rate is really high and your session duration is really low. Those are indicators that something's not quite right, which is why people are leaving right away. And then the last thing you want to look at when you're looking at this are spikes in the graph. 
Does this correlate to any of your marketing efforts or anyone doing marketing for you? For example, the Darien Library put out on their website and in their newsletter upcoming classes. So when that happens, I see a spike in my graph. When I put up my own newsletter, I see a spike in my graph. Meaning, because of that, people went to my website, so I had a spike. So right here, there was a spike on this graph between January, but mid-January and February. That directly correlates to my newsletter going out in January of this year, which showcased the upcoming classes, so people came to the website. That's a good thing. That's an indicator that your marketing efforts are working. So let's talk now about your Google Search Console. You've set up your analytics. You now are collecting data on how people are getting to your website. You're collecting data on how long they're spending on your website. Now what? Now we're gonna figure out how your site is performing in Google Search. So there's how your website looks and feels to the users, which is where analytics comes in. And then there's Google Search, which is in terms of your organic search. This is the key part of your SEO right? This is where you're going to submit your sitemap. This is where you're going to find the keywords that you're currently performing for. And you're going to determine if your website has errors, because if your website has broken links and such, your Google search console can help you identify that so you can fix that. If you've come to my basics class, you'll know that broken links and those type of errors are actually uh, negative on your SEO ranking score. So you want to make sure you take care of those so that Google's not you know, dinging you where you could be gaining traction on your SEO ranking points. So let's set up your Google Search Console. Whereas with analytics, you can just go to analytics.google.com. Google Search Console, it, the URL is a bit, it says search.google.com. If you actually type that into the browser, it take you to a Google Search Bar. So what you're better off doing is actually going to Google and typing in Google Search Console, which the very first link will take you there. Whether or not you've used Google, Google Search Console in the past, whether you've set it up before, this is the screen you're going to get. And then you're gonna come here and figure out how do you add your property? There is a question that I'm gonna take now that says, uh, are these Google Search con Console and Analytics sites sub subscription-based or no cost? So the answer is they're free. So I should have started with that. Thank you for that question. So they are free tools for any and all business owners to use. The only caveat is you have access to the back end of your website so you can connect it. So once you've come to your Google Search Console, in the upper left corner, there's gonna be a dropdown. In this case, you can see the name of my website. When you click it, you get a drop down. In this case, these are different websites that I have access to, and I'm scrolling down to the bottom to add a property. In your case, you may not see that you might just get add a property if this is your first one. Once you add the property, you're gonna or click the button for add the property. You're gonna come to this screen. This screen gives you the option to add it via the domain or add it via the URL prefix. This is where I go advanced and basic users. As much as I've done this a million times, I still use the basic user, which is the URL prefix. Once you get into the domain side, you have to have access to your DNS and your cPanel and it could get a little complicated. So there's no reason to do all of that if you can just do it by the URL prefix, which is where you're just typing in, as it says there, www.yourwebsite.com. The next step is if you set up your analytics already and you set it up under the same Google account, you should get this step that says ownership auto verify. If you don't get this step, then there's, it'll give you instructions for how to do it. But more often, once you set up your analytics first, it auto verifies so you can skip, you know, go to property. You're done at this step. Once you're done, your screen looks like this. In this case, I have performance data. In your case, it's gonna say no data yet because you just set it up. But on the left side of the screen, there's something called sitemaps. Your sitemap is a list of everything on your website. It is basically an, a list of all the pages, the images, all the text. So what you're doing is you're submitting your sitemap to Google because Google is using that to index your website. Remember we talked about, well, how does Google get into your aggregator and give people information based on what your website is about? When you first build a website, if you do not submit your sitemap, 
basically you join the back of the line. Google will eventually crawl your website when it gets to it. There may be 60,000 websites in front of you. There may be 600,000 websites in front of you. And your website may not get indexed for weeks, days, months, maybe even years, depending on when you launched your website and when Google discovers it. By submitting your site map, you're actually telling Google, hey, I exist. This is a website that you need to index. So you can see here, I submitted this site map in November. And the last time I was read based on this screenshot was February 20th. What happens is, is that whenever you update your website, the site map gets updated. And then Google is, receives a notification that your site map is updated and it re-indexes your website. There is an open question in our world around or the SEO world around whether Google re-indexes the entire website or just the portion that you updated. It's a bit of an unknown, but I always say you can't go wrong with just having Google re-index your website, whether it's a small piece or a big piece. Re-indexing is always good because it improves your chances of moving up in the rankings. Now, you might say, how do I know what my site map is? I'm going to pause here for a moment so you can grab your phones and take a screenshot. If you're on WordPress, it's sitemap underscore index.com dot XML. If you're using the Yoast plugin, I strongly recommend for WordPress users, use the Yoast plugin. It's free and it'll allow you to fill in your title and meta. And again, the SEO basics class cover exactly what those are. If you're on Squarespace, Wix or Shopify, it's as simple as sitemap dot XML. Now, if you type all your sitemap, don't worry, Google will actually give you an error on the previous screen that I showed you and it'll say, could not fetch sitemap. So in this case, you'll know if you got it right or wrong because Google will either say success or couldn't fetch. So let's look at the performance report. After a time, you'll start to see something that looks like this. It's a bunch of squiggly lines, it's a bunch of crazy stuff and you're like, what does this really mean? So first on the left side, after you get from your overview, you're gonna click performance. It brings you here. When you scroll down, that takes you to the queries. What you're looking for here, this is essentially telling you what you're performing for currently. These are not keywords that you should program for. This is what you're already performing for. So in this case, I am performing for edge space, edge space marketing, website pricing calculator, website cost estimator, SEO best practices, website design calculator, and promotional product partners. Now, this was report, this screenshot was taken in February. If I were to pull the report today, it would look slightly different because since this report, I've tweaked my SEO slightly. So some of these numbers are different. When the right side of the screen, what you're looking at are clicks and impressions. Clicks are, as they are, clicks, the number of times someone actually clicked on your website based on the search criteria on the left. Impressions are the number of time you've showed up in a search query result. So for example, edge space, I showed up 97 times in this time frame. That's a good thing to me. There's other ones going down that I'm showing up for, but people aren't necessarily clicking. And as I mentioned before, that is by design given my marketing efforts. If this is what you're looking at for your business and you're highly dependent on your web traffic, then we really need to figure out why aren't people clicking? Why are they clicking your competitors before they click you? This are some of the things we have to figure out by using this report. So now that you've set up your Google Analytics and you've set up your Google Search Console, let's talk about your Google My Business. So your Google My Business is a listing on what's actually Google Maps. And so you get there by going to business.google.com. And from here, the screen looks like this on the right, much like the search console where you're like, it starts kind of like start now. In your case, you can try sign in or manage now if you already have a Google My Business set up, or you're gonna go to manage now. It's primarily used to gather reviews. It's a really good place to get testimonials and reviews from your clients on your products, on your services, on yourself. It's also free for anyone with a Gmail account. So if you have a business that most people have Office 365 or Outlook, you are going to need a Gmail account in order to set this up. And actually I should go back and say the same will go for your analytics and your Google Search Console. They are all dependent on you having a Google account. It does not have to be a G Suite account that you paid for, just a plain free, you know, my name at gmail.com is sufficient. You're able to control your contact detail, your hours, and list your website there. This is very important. During the pandemic, 
a lot of businesses did not set up their Google My Business and scammers started taking them over and routing traffic to fake websites. So this is another way to make sure that you keep your information validated and you don't end up on other folks' websites or someone starting to steal your traffic. This is also really, really good if you have a physical storefront. I have a virtual business, but I have a service area. My service area is the United States and globally. It's not a big deal for me, but if you have a physical storefront and you are highly dependent on micro uh, local traffic, meaning only this area, you know, Stanford, Connecticut, Darien, and there's a certain specific vicinity, then it's important to have your physical location listed on the map with a pin. So by using your Google My Business, you're able to control that. Once you create the Google My Business listing, it's the first step for local searches when people do search for something near me. This has increased triple fold in the last two years, particularly before the pandemic and increased even more now. So now folks don't say, you know, web development, Stanford, Connecticut, they might say web development near me or gas station near me. I know when I'm driving, I do it all the time, coffee shop near me so they can find the closest one to my physical location. This could get a little tricky and don't get too caught up in it, but where we are, we are technically close to Long Island. So often I do see businesses listed for Long Island showing up because across the sound, they're right there. So it wouldn't worry too much about that. Just worry about how you capture the traffic where you are locally. So let's talk about how you set it up. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna either claim your business or add your business. This can be a little tricky to understand, but when you get to this screen and you start to type in your business name, it will either already be listed in Google's list and you can claim it, or you'll just add it to the list so that Google will set up a new listing for you. Sometimes Google gets this information from all kinds of data on the internet, whether you registered a business, you have a PO box, whether you know the Google Maps van drove by and took a picture of your storefront. It's very interesting how businesses are on here and some businesses are not, even those with physical locations. You are gonna then choose your verification option. More often than not, the only verification option you're going to get is for a postcard. And that is where they're going to mail you a postcard, a square piece of paper with six digit code that you have to wait for in the mail. Once you request a verification, this is really, really important. Do not update any of the other screens. I wish they would fix the interface. Unfortunately, it's confusing. What happens is, is that you can request a verification and then your postcard gets sent off in the mail somewhere. And then you get to these screens that say, oh, what's your hours? What are your contact details? What are all these things? And you start filling them in thinking, great, I'm following the steps on the screen. What ends up happening is that Google suspends your listing for suspicious activity. It makes no sense, but we ran into this with three or four clients in the past year. And the solution was that we should not have updated anything until the verification code is entered. So the postcard comes between five and seven days. And so what you're gonna do is basically get to this screen and request a verification. And then the bottom of every other screen says skip. Once you get the verification code, you're going to fill it in and then you can fill in all the other details, contact details and such. But there's also a very important thing you have to be careful. The line where your business name is, do not put any SEO keywords there. So for example, I cannot put edge space marketing, digital marketing, edge space marketing, web development, unless that's the actual name of my business. But Google is cross-referencing this information somehow. And what they're trying to do is make sure people are not what's called keyword stuffing. So all you're allowed to put in that line is the name of your business, whether you choose or um, choose to include your LLCs or not. So for example, my business official's name is Edge Space Marketing, LLC. I'm allowed to just say Edge Space Marketing. That's also okay. So some businesses choose to drop the LLC if it's not that important to them. So now that you've set up all of these things, now you're going to go, well, I'm seeing that I'm getting traffic, but it's not necessarily qualified traffic. How do I find my keywords? This is the most important part of your SEO. Once you know your keywords, secondly, you're going to jump back to last week's class and fill in all your ranking factors in the different places. But first, let's figure out what those keywords are. So we're going to use something called Google Trends. 
Google basically provides us a list of everything and anything people are searching on the internet. You ever hear of those things and go, oh, the most popular keyword that was searched in this time frame was X. They're getting that information from Google Trends. They're basically showing you the trends of how people Google. So what are Google Trends and why do you want to use it? This is where you're going to learn what your target market is searching for. And then you can write about trending topics to help drive traffic to your website. That may not necessarily be blogs, that could just be the content in the sections. This also will help you qualify how you figure out your keywords. People often say it's a guessing game. And to be honest with you, when you start off, it is a guessing game. But after you spend some time going through this, you will then start to qualify. And I'll show you what I mean in terms of you make an educated guess, and then you kind of make another educated guess based on the content you're seeing. You're also able to see what topics are currently cap capturing the public's imagination. Like what are the trending topics that are happening, whether it's music or just kind of new keywords or phrases people are using. And you can figure out how to take advantage of that as part of your marketing campaigns. You can also figure out if seasonal trends factor into your marketing strategy. And I'll give you a very specific example in the next round of screenshots of what seasonal trends look like. So for example, we're going to talk about a flower shop. Here we're able to fill in in Google Trends. You can look for one term. You can notice across the top, you can continue to add terms, excuse me. So first we looked at flower shop, which is the blue line. Then we've got flowers for mom, that's the red line. And then we've got gifts from mom, which is the orange, I guess we'll call that an orange line. When we look at the blue line, if you are a flower shop, if you're a flower shop, you're seeing spikes, which looks like Mother's Day, right? Between February and July. And then you're also seeing a spike towards the end of the year. So maybe people are getting flowers from mom around the holidays. But generally throughout the year, excuse me, flower shop, generally throughout the year, people are still looking for flower shops. Now, this interest over time graph can get confusing. It's based out of a score of 100. Now, what that when you hover over the little question mark, it just tells you that it's a volume indicator. So it's not really clear what it means in terms of the volume of your search, other than it's a performing search criteria. So just kind of take that with a grain of salt. So it doesn't mean that there were 100 searches. It's just based on a volume of how Google decided that this search is performing. So you'll see uh, gifts for mom is showing up specifically at a time where, you know, they're spiking around what looks like Mother's Day. And then it's also looking around the holiday and then there's a distinct drop off. Those are also important trends to keep in mind because again, if you're a flower shop and you wanna use gifts for mom, that's a good idea because it is performing. However, notice that the phrase flower for moms is more or less a flat line. So if you are going to use a keyword, the keywords I see here that are performing are flower shop, flowers, excuse me, gifts for mom, but flowers for mom aren't necessarily doing as well. Doesn't mean you can't include those keywords, just know that that's not necessarily a high performing keyword. It's just something that people sometimes search. When you dig a little deeper, so this is specifically just for the flower shop, which you can see in the upper left corner. As you're going down, you can see the regions where the subregions, rather in the United States, where the flower shop phrase is performing the most. Now, this may not be useful for you if you don't necessarily have a region specific need, or you're just curious to see where traffic is coming from. This is not specific to your website. This is a generalization. The other thing to keep in mind is that some of this data is skewed, meaning a lot of users have gotten savvy and they've turned off tracking on a lot of stuff. I do it myself. Wherever possible, I turn off every tracking possible. So in those cases, you may see something that says data not available. That just means that they might not just have enough data to create these graphs for you. And it's an indicator that might not be the right keyword to aim for as one of your primary keywords. Maybe it's one of the ones lower on your list. You're also looking for related topics on the left side at the bottom. You'll see here, there's something about when we're looking for a flower shop, Morgan Well, an American singer, not sure who that is. Corsage is a topic, but then flower shop, it's a pub in New York City, not really related, but corsage is an interesting one. You know, you're a flower shop, but you also sell corsages. So people are searching for this 250 times more than flower shop. 
if you see the little 250 plus next to corsage. So that's an indicator that you should probably investigate that a little more. These are clickable. So when you click it, before we click it, I'll show you on the other side, you also have related queries and corsage shows up again. So now you've got a double indicator that corsage is probably a keyword you should absolutely use, especially if you sell corsages. Now, if you don't sell corsages, don't use that keyword. So let's now look into corsage. After seeing it on the previous report, it made me think, okay, so we should look into corsages some more. So here we have a different report with two different spikes in the graph. This first spike is between February and June. That's around May, which tells you that's prom season which kind of thought about already, okay. But then there's another spike in the graph around October. Now, when I first looked at this, I was like, what's happening in October? Then I realized October is homecoming for a lot of school districts and colleges. So that's another time people might need corsages. So for, for a flower shop business where corsages may be a smaller part of their business, however, they have two times of year where it's going to be a bigger part of their business. So this is where seasonal trends come in. The seasonality of corsages are important. And so this is where you decide, is this something you aim for as like a high priority keyword or is maybe a secondary, but you make sure it's somewhere that's necessary that people can find you. When you dig in even more and looking at related topics and related queries, you see other things that can help you drive other keywords and build out your list. So for example, on the left side, we have homecoming, prom. I mean, there's things around colors, which not may, may or may not be important. And you can see there's 13 more topics you can dig, dig into. On the right side of your screen, you have prom corsage, the specific phrase, prom corsage is 2021. That specific phrase was Googled, which means that in 2021, if you had a flower shop business, that should have been an exact keyword. Maybe it's in a blog or something. There's even one that says, you know, these number two and number three are really good ideas for blog articles. If you're looking for what should I write a blog about? Well, what side does a boutonniere go on? That's a blog in itself because that's exactly what somebody searched for. And if you were to blog with that exact phrase as a title, chances of your website getting found could be high depending on all the other factors that go into it. Same for the next one, number three. Do you wear a corsage for homecoming? Somebody, or what, as it says here, 4,800 times percent wise. So imagine that, like the, the 4,000, like 4,800 percentage times, not 100 times more, 4,800 times more people have searched for this. You should really write a blog about that if you have a flower shop. So this is how you get those ideas for how do I figure out those keywords and how they work together. And I will tell you this, Google Search Console is a bit of a rabbit hole, excuse me, and your Google Trends. As you go down and you start digging into this, you can spend hours and days in here and that's okay. Just know that at some point you have to stop and build your list. I do always say aim for anywhere from 10 to 25 keyword lists, meaning that's one word, four words, three words, like your keywords in this case, do you wear a corsage for homecoming? That is a seven, technically a seven letter keyword. So that's what's called a long tail keyword phrase. So next week we'll talk a little bit more about those keyword phrases and how to identify them even further. But this is just giving you started on how to identify them. So you're not completely guessing. So now that you've figured out Google Trends, you may be an advanced user that are ready to jump into Google Keyword Planner. Here's what I will say. As much as I am an advanced user, I don't necessarily use Google Keyword Planner myself because it can get a little tricky. This report gets very complicated to read and it's also more designed for folks looking for Google AdWords where you're paying for the ads to show up based on your search criteria. So what you're going to do when you get to your Google Keyword Planner, this one um, to the earlier question in terms of whether or not it needs to be paid or not, it's still technically free, but you do need to have a Google Keywords account or an ads manager account, which is required to be linked to a credit card. So for some people, including myself, you could be a little gun shy about trying to go in there. So I don't recommend you use Keyword Planner until you're more comfortable with Google Trends. This is the advanced stage. As much as I use Google Trends, 
I'm not ready yet even to get into the Google Keyword Planner because if you accidentally click the wrong button, you might accidentally end up owing Google money. And I don't want to be in that business. And so unless you're really comfortable, you don't have to go into the Keyword Planner. But there are some benefits to it if you are comfortable. You're able to enter more than one words, phrases, or even a URL related to your business, and Google will provide you the keyword suggestion. So the idea is it takes some of the guesswork out of it. You don't have to guess the way you're guessing with Google Trends. And as you can see here, it gives you low, medium, and high competition on some of these keywords. In this screenshot, it was specific to a keyword around SEO. Now, in terms of whether you want to aim for low competitive word, medium competitive word, high competitive word, it's up to you. This is where that qualified traffic comes in. A highly competitive word means that a lot of websites are trying to get to that word or that key phrase. And you can find yourself having a hard time kind of jumping over websites that have been around longer that may have better SEO ranking points than you. So unless you're super confident in that space, maybe you want to aim for some medium ones and some low ones too. I always recommend mixing it up. Low means it's not as competitive, but it is performing. If you're looking at this, it's moving kind of fast, the jiffy. But if you can see, even though there's keywords showing up as competitively low, the average monthly searches are anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 searches a month. That's still a significant volume. So sometimes when you're looking at low, medium, and high, you do want to take into account whether or not the volume of search that goes into it matters. So for example, if web development is a high, excuse me, a highly competitive keyword, I may not necessarily look for that. I may use a medium competitively keyword that might just say web development for small businesses or web development for nonprofits based on how these reports come out and based on my validation. So it's a bit of a, you know, taking in the information and figuring out what works best for you. Well, you'll also see after you see your monthly searches and your competition, you're also going to see the top of the page bid for the low and the high range. So this is for where if you're doing Google ads, the value of that keyword. If you notice, this is moving really fast, but some of these keywords cost 23 cents, but then they also could go up to $13 and $16. I mean, this is in pounds based on the available Jiffy on the internet, but it's no different in dollars. The keywords will continue to range based on competitiveness. This is where Google ads become tricky because it's a set budget per se, but you might find yourself in a situation where you've maybe not configured your keywords the greatest and you're not getting qualified traffic. So you're getting a lot of traffic, but you're paying per click. And based on the popularity of that keyword, you could potentially be paying 23 cents per click or $16 for the same click. It just depends on the market value and how that's changing. Now, I'm sure there's some experts that can tell you in terms of when the numbers change and how you keep an eye on it. It can be tricky. So I always tell folks, unless you have a, an expert in Google ads, I don't recommend you do it yourself. Google trends, yes, but Google ads get tricky. And I've heard horror stories of people owing Google thousands of dollars because they misconfigured their keywords. And the sad part is because it's a pay-per-click and then those terms and conditions, those really long ones that we don't necessarily read, people often get caught in that clause that says, you agree to pay Google regardless if you misconfigured it or not. So if you are going to do Google ads, just make sure you have an expert who understands it very well and who will hopefully not get you into a situation where you have to pay Google hundreds or thousands of dollars unnecessarily. So we've just covered quite a bit of information for Google, all of the different Google tools, and I wanted to open it up for questions for the technicalities or anything you might have on that front. Um, I see someone raise their hand. You can go ahead and put your questions right in the chat or in the Q&A box um, on the top or bottom of your screen, depending on how you have your Zoom set up. In the Google Search Console, where was the query section? That's a really good question. Let's go back and look at it. So if we go back to Google Search Console, pardon me for going backward. Let's go on back one more here. 
So when you get to your Google Search Console and you click on the Performance tab, you will see here you have these graphs. Underneath the graphs, it says Queries. And then it also has pages and countries and devices. So some of this overlaps with your Google Analytics, but your queries is right here on the bottom. And thank you for that. And the next time I do this presentation, I'll put a little arrow so you can find it. But it's down here, if you can see my cursor, right in the lower, I guess the middle of your screen. And when it comes up, it looks like this when you scroll down. Uh, the question is, do you help with do you help with Google Ads set up for small business? And is this session recorded? Yes, this session is recorded. Unfortunately, I do not do Google Ads because as much as I know SEO, I'm not an expert in setting up the keywords in a way to make sure that you don't get charged extra. And it's just not something we're able to do right now. But there's lots of Google Ads experts out there. Just make sure you ask a lot of questions in terms of how it works and if you can get some uh Maybe you can interview former clients or check their Google reviews on their Google My Business. See if there's a question in the Q&A. Oh, so the question is, uh, they're working with a nonprofit and is there handouts or will the recording slides be shareable? So uh, the recording will be on Google, uh, excuse me, on YouTube uh, within the next day, if I'm not mistaken. And so you can rewatch it there so that you can go through at your own pace and uh, check the different options. The next question is, when I look at my search results on Google, the subheadings that show up would not be what have I selected. How does Google do that? Oh, you're, are, um, and thank you for that question, Scott. And just to clarify, would you clarify for me, when you say the subheadings, are you talking about in Google itself, the items that show up underneath about services? Is that what you're talking about? Um, I'll wait for you to come back. I'll take this other question in the meantime. Uh, the question is, how do you find YouTube search trends? That's a really good question, Dan. There's actually websites out there. I think if you just Google YouTube search trends, you, you can actually get the keywords specific to YouTube. And that's a really, really good question. Generally speaking, is that your Google trends report are not necessarily the same keywords that you're going to use on YouTube. They're also not the same keywords that you're going to use on Instagram. Those both have their own keyword criteria. So that's a very good question. And I don't have that information handy. If you do want to email me after class, I can help you find it. But I do know that there's websites that help aggregate the YouTube search trends. Um, there was a question that came through that says, what's the best way to master SEO? So uh, for that person, what do you want to do is last week's class, which was recorded, which was on SEO basics, I would start there. From there, you'll understand the technicalities of your ranking factors, because this information, setting up your analytics and your reporting, it's kind of the next step once you've kind of set up your ranking factors so you can show up. You can do them in any order, but I do recommend you start with the basics where you can understand how the different ranking factors influence your Google performance. You can have all the right keywords, but if you put them in the wrong place, if you have bad quality on your website, you have spam or intrusive ads, all of these things can impact how you perform. So the basic class is a really good class to get an understanding of how that works. All right, oh, and there was an answer uh, from the library that last week's video is, is being edited and uh, she will email everyone once they're online. Um, and so we did have a follow up from the earlier question, which was on the Google search results, I have my business show up, but under the heading random pages of my website, not the pages I would have chosen. So uh, Scott, what happens is, is that Google is determining what are the best performing pages, what people might most be interested in based on uh, different search criteria, again, your performance. And so it's always a good idea to submit your site map because based on your site map, their primary pages should show up, but then also it'll help Google understand what are the most important pages. So if you're finding that other odd pages are showing up, you know, perhaps we can look at that offline and see if there's something specific. Maybe those are your better performing pages. You can check your Google Analytics or your search console and see if those are high performing pages as well. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, let's see if there's anything in the chat. All 
All right, we've got 10 more minutes for questions. If anybody has anything else, just put it out there one more time. Um, let's see, what do we got? All right. Does anybody have any burning questions about how their websites perform in Google since we have some time? We had the earlier question of random things show up. Someone says, I get an error when trying to verify my account in Google. Could you spare specify which error you're getting when you're trying to verify? I'm assuming that's your Google My Business you're trying to verify. So for your Google My Business, um, it might, depending on what that is, it is possible that, you know, maybe the account has been flagged. Usually the best thing to do is, and it's a bit complicated and you may need to reach out to me offline, is um, you need to put in a ticket with them to see if you can get some insight in terms of why the verification is failing. Often when the verification is failing, it's because the account's already been suspended, which then we have to figure out. And the downside is Google doesn't specifically tell you how to get around the verification or why your website failed or was suspended. We kind of have to do some guesswork or make an educated guess based on what we know the criteria is. So if you want to go back to the, the list uh, when you look at the recording for the Google My Business where it says um, don't, maybe you put in one of the don't criteria where you have something extra in your business name. So there's another question that says, trying hard to get traffic to my website, recently started pushing heavy on Google, but no luck. So, um, so Anya, so I would definitely start by looking at your reports, set up your analytics, set up your search console. That's the first step in figuring out whether or not, even if your sitemap's not there, you know, some of my clients that I get that come to me for SEO help, sometimes their previous web developer completely missed the step of submitting their sitemap to Google. And so in the end, you're waiting for Google to index you whenever it gets around to it. So if you were to confirm that your sitemap is there, you know, you can just kind of check that off the list. The next side of it is to start looking at those queries and how you're actually performing. Once you get a sense of how you're actually performing, you're then going to then go to Google Trends and start thinking about, okay, what are some adjacent topics? What else are folks searching for that can bring traffic to my website? And the reports that I'm talking about, yes, are in Google Analytics and Google Search Console. You're gonna look at both reports. All right, just check in the chat and the Q&A, see if we have any other questions. So while we wait for some folks to think through their questions, I'm gonna give you a quick uh, overview of the um, ranking factors since that's come up a little bit today. So your ranking factors are a combination of elements that work together for Google. Google is looking at how your website is built, is it mobily responsive? Is it modern? Is it outdated? Is it, you know, colors that work together that are easy for someone to read? Like all of that matters, right? But then Google is also looking at the quality of what you wrote on your website, meaning that the words actually make grammatical sense, that someone can make sense of the headings and the details. But then it's also looking at things that you could be doing wrong. Do you have intrusive ads, spams, scams popping up? There's some violation categories. And it's a weighted score. So sometimes if you have, let's say, and it, this is a made up number, so don't quote me on it. Let's say you have 20 points of good things happening. So you're moving up in your ranking 20 points, but then you have intrusive ads and pop-ups that are in the violation category. You may drop 10 points. So for every good thing that you get, it's a weighted amount of bad points that Google takes away from you because they're trying to make sure that you're the most qualified person for that. That is a super high level explanation of your ranking factors. If you, when you get a chance to see last week's class, when it goes up, you'll be able to see it in details, all of the elements of what I call the periodic table of SEO elements. We break it down into the different verticals. All right, so that kind of covers your high levels and low levels about it. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. How long does it take to get on the first page of Google if you optimize your website for SEO? That's a very good question. And it's a tricky question. It can take anywhere from days to months 
to years. It's, it's one of those things that it depends on. You remember what we talked about, those highly competitive keywords and low level competitive keywords. It also impacts like, are you doing social media posts that have related content? To give you a real life example, I was working with a client that has a fitness gym. It's not necessarily a personal training gym. They do group fitness, but one of their fitness type, it's not quite CrossFit either, but they part of their fitness regimen is for Spartan training. If you're doing a Spartan race or a Tough Mudder, one of those. So because that's a lesser part of their business, but an important keyword, we put it in on the website and Google refused to take that keyword. When we put it into the Google My Business, Google crossed it out. When we put it on the website, we wouldn't perform. But a couple months in, he decided to do a social media post about Spartan training and how their fitness regimen can help you with that. The next thing we saw was that Spartan training showed up on the report and it took him doing a social media post so that Google connect the dots and say, okay, yes, their website does say it. Now their social media says it, they're qualified in this space. Now we show up for it. So that's an example how one keyword that it was a lesser keyword in terms of importance, still important, but it's a keyword that we took three months trying to get to. And it wasn't until we did a social media post on it did Google connect those dots? So I say that to say, sometimes you may see immediate results and then other times it may take working your entire digital ecosystem to get there. Any other questions or concerns? And uh, the library put in the chat, they now have access to lynda.com type videos. That, are, uh, that include Google Analytics. So for those of you who are trying to get familiar with it, that's a really good resource you should take advantage of. The link is there in the chat for your use. Uh, you're welcome for the question that came through in the chat. You're welcome. Uh, we try really hard to make SEO uh, easy to understand and digestible. So uh, last call for questions. We've got a few more minutes. Um, if not, we'll close it out and feel free. I'll put my contact details up on the screen. Feel free to reach out if you have questions or follow up. Some of you had a little bit more complicated scenarios you wanted to dig in, but uh, last call for SEO questions, Google questions, uh, Google tools questions. And I'm gonna pause 30 more seconds, see if there's anybody who might just be thinking or still typing. We're getting some thank you. So thank you're welcome, everyone. My pleasure being here. So I think that's it for questions for today. We didn't have a huge group, but thank you all for being here. Thank you for your questions. It always helps. And hopefully you were able to take away something that will help your SEO journey go a little bit better and you can figure out how that traffic on your website is working. Um, as a reminder, in a bit, the SEO basis class will be available for you so that you can take a look at the ranking factors and understand that a little bit better. I will caveat that by saying it is a very technical undertaking and don't be overwhelmed. Try to take away two or three things from the whole thing. And as you learn, it'll get easier. Then you will implement your Google Analytics, Search Console, Google My Business, all of your Google tools. And then if you join me next week, we're going to talk about in greater detail how to build out that keyword list and how to understand what's called your user search intent. That's the bigger part of your keyword list. And the link for that class just dropped in the chat where we're going to talk about SEO keywords and understanding your user search intent. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Very much appreciated. Thank you for all your questions. And I look forward to seeing you next week, Monday, when we talk about SEO keywords and understanding your user search intent. Thanks everyone.